So, hello. Um, thank you all for coming uh, to this uh, to this lecture tonight by the sponsored by the Han Arendt Center and the Human Rights Project here at Bard. Um, tonight uh, we have, I think, a, a very special and interesting uh, opportunity to think about current events uh, as well as uh, think more philosophically. Um, our lecture tonight is by Aicha Chahuchu, who uh, is currently teaching at Harvard University uh, in the social studies faculty. Uh, she has her PhD from Columbia in anthropology, although she's a, a, an anthropologist who is incredibly well versed in and at home in political theory, and uh, in many ways uh, is as much a political theoretical anthropologist uh, as I've been learning. Uh, who's also um, very influenced by, interested in Hannah Arendt's work, um, which is how I first uh, came across her. Um, she, she's done a dissertation, which is now close to being a finished manuscript, uh, that looked at the uh, World Tribunal in Iraq, uh, which was an attempt of people to get together and, 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 try, and, and put people on trial in Iraq, obviously without government sanction. Uh, but uh, a very interesting project, um, and she's been working as well on cosmopolitanism, and lately been writing on the question of Libya and the responsibility to protect. So uh, please join me in welcoming Aicha Chibushu. to the Human Rights Project and the RN Center in particular. Uh, I won't be talking explicitly about RN tonight, although if you, some, if you see some glimpses of her thinking, I would take it as a great compliment. Um, all right. These thoughts are very fresh, written in the current crisis afflicting Libya and the debates concerning intervention in Libya. So I'm very much open to your comments. These are thoughts in the making, so to speak, trying to respond to current events. Um, I will be reading, hopefully it won't sound like a written piece, it will sound like a speech, let's see. Uh, the title of the talk is Libya and the Responsibility to Protect, Notes for an Anthropology of Cosmopolitan Authority. Libyans are begging to be saved, we've been told. We're also told that the international community has the responsibility to protect Libyans. It is March 2011. There are calls for the international community to intervene, if necessary, with violence into Libyan affairs. Falling short of some expectations and exceeding others, the United Nations Security Council recently passed a resolution on 26 February 2011 imposing sanctions on Libya. I quote from the resolution, Considering that the widespread and systematic attacks currently taking place in Libya against the civil civilian population may amount to crimes against humanity, unquote, the Security Council also decided to refer what it called the situation to the International Criminal Court. Meanwhile, Libya, as an actor in global politics, is said to be a sovereign state. The Security Council resolution thus uh, affirms, I quote, reaffirms its strong commitment to the sovereignty, independence, territorial integrity, and national unity, unquote, of Libya. Under normal conditions, that is, within limits, Libya is recognized as an autonomous actor capable of determining, self-determining its so-called internal and <coughs> external affairs without international interference. On the other hand, the very framing of the state violence unleashed against the uprising citizens of Libya as a potential crimes against humanity, suggests that the limits of sovereignty, 
state sovereignty may have been reached. I want to ask, what are these limits? Who draws them and how? Which conceptions of authority are mobilized or appealed to in drawing or enforcing limits to state sovereignty? What is the responsibility to protect as a legal and normative framework? And what is its ethical foundation? In this talk, I will examine such questions by reflecting on the kinds of cosmopolitan authority exercised in relation to the current situation in Libya. My aim is to sketch some ways in which an anthropology of cosmopolitan authority can be undertaken. From the perspective of what people call the international community, sovereignty is a privilege it confers onto Libya, a status with certain responsibilities attached. Among these responsibilities, the United Nations Security Council resolution calls, in its recent resolution, I quote, the Libyan authority is the Libyan authority's responsibility to protect its population. Unquote. As elaborated in the context of the NATO intervention in Kosovo, when a state fails to fulfill this responsibility, the responsibility to protect this population, the logic goes, then the international community must take on the responsibility to protect the population in question. As evidenced by the forceful liberation of Iraq, in conjunction with the responsibility to protect framework, some further argue that beyond its coercive capacity and responsibility to protect its population, a state must also be democratic to earn the recognition and affirmation of its sovereignty by the international community. I will discuss these frameworks shortly. First, I would like to pose the following question. Who makes up this international community? Who are its actors? Once known as the Committee of Civilized Nations, the international community is traditionally understood as a collection of sovereign states. In the last four decades, moreover, various actors, from the United Nations Security Council to Human Rights Watch, from the European Union to Amnesty International, from the United States to the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, have all spoken as the international community. <clears throat> Finally, today, many cosmopolitans would insist that besides or even beyond states and institutions, individuals as humans are the international community's quote-unquote members. If sovereignty is the recognized privilege of an autonomous state within the international legal framework, it is neither conferred indiscriminately nor maintained indefinitely. In fact, throughout history, various standards have been formulated and applied in deciding the sovereign status of a given entity. While international lawyers developed what they called the standard of civilization in the 19th century to discriminate sovereign from non-sovereign or quasi-sovereign entities in the context of colonization, in the 21st century, countless other practitioners and theorists have specified and elaborated what they call universal standards which an entity such as Libya should meet if its sovereign status is to be affirmed by the international community. Some cosmopolitans are less humble and project their vocation as the articulation of, I'm quoting from David Held of London School of Economics, 
project their vocation as the articulation of what he calls universal, princip universal principles which must shape and limit all human activity. Unquote. These universal principles are thus the designation of what he calls the necessary boundaries which no human activity should cross. Unquote. In the cosmopolitan case, what must be administered are not merely the standards sovereign states must adhere to, but what Held calls the proper limits to human diversity as such. So, rather enthusiastic formulation. Note that a universal jurisdiction declared over all human activity necessitates an anthropology of humanity in order to first define and then police the boundaries which no human activity should cross. Until recently, specifically until 2008, when the United States reached an agreement with Libya to fight as comrades in the global war on terror, Libya was considered a rogue state by the US. However, the Bush administration announced that it was resuming what it called normal diplomatic relations with Libya as early as May 2006. Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice explained this move by noting, I'm quoting from Condoleezza Rice, Libya's continued commitment to its renunciation of terrorism and the excellent cooperation Libya has provided to the United States and other members of the international community in response to common global threats faced by the civilized world since September 11, 2001." Unquote. Before then, similar to a number of failed states, what they call failed states around the world, which were said to have failed morally, economically, politically, or effectively according to certain international standards, Libya was also part of the axis of evil. It had the ambiguous state, I mean the ambiguous status of an outlaw, a quasi-sovereignty, a dangerous entity to be sanctioned, isolated and contained, if not destroyed altogether. On 26 February this year, when the Security Council referred Libya's case to the International Criminal Court, it further marked its leadership as suspected enemies of humanity. In its resolution, the Security Council also affirmed that, I quote, it shall keep the Libyan authorities' actions under continuous review and that it shall be prepared to review the appropriateness of measures contained in this resolution, unquote reserving the possibility of strengthening its measures. What actions such as strengthening may involve still remain ambiguous. They can certainly include, however, a military intervention. If so, if the UN Security Council, NATO, the United States, or another entity decides to assume the responsibility to protect Libyans, with which conception of authority would it be acting? In Mahmoud Mamdani's words, who has the responsibility to protect whom, under what conditions and toward what end? And why, the question must be added, why is there supposed to be a responsibility to protect in the first place? Libyans are begging to be saved, we've been told. It is now March 15, 2011. On March 10, the Republic of France recognized the sovereignty of the Interim Transitional National Council of the Libyan Republic, presumably as the legitimate representative of the Libyan people. You know about this council, right? France is scheduled to send an ambassador to Benghazi soon but she may arrive too late or too early. Everything depends on how transitional or permanent the new government will be, located as it is, I'm quoting from their founding declaration, 
in the city of Benghazi, the temporary location, till the liberation of Tripoli, the capital city, and the permanent location of the council, unquote, as its founders declared on March 5th, 2011. Yes. Um, just, to, just to clarify, the current rebel government is still under attack by the Nazi forces, right? Yes, yes. And France is not recognizing Nazi anymore. Uh, we'll come to that. Right. Reacting to news of the French recognition, a representative of the Interim Transitional National Council reportedly thanked the French government, claiming that the Libyan people were very grateful to the French. Such gratitude is not exceptional in France's imperial history, of course. Punctuated as it is, by the revolutionary violence, guidance, and occupation offered as liberation and fraternal assistance to oppressed people. Haitians may testify to the nature of France's universal values and their proper application. Libyans are begging to be saved, we're told. From humanitarians to neoconservative ideologues, newspaper editors to heads of state, the international community is literally petitioning to save Libyans. The United States, the European Union, the Arab League, and NATO are considering the imposition of a no-fly zone and other military options, citing the need to protect Libyans. NATO has already moved warships and planes close to Libya. In the meantime, Analysts have warned that such an apparently harmless action as a no-fly zone entails violence, airstrikes, and deadly consequences. The U.S. Secretary of Defense Robert Gates being one of the first to recognize that a no-fly zone, I quote, begins with an attack on Libya. Some international lawyers, among them Richard Falk, have asserted that a no-fly zone would be an act of war, urging the international community to kick what Richard Paul calls its habit of intervention. Meanwhile, members of the Trans Transitional National Council of Libya, in a founding act, I quote from their declaration, request from the international community to fulfill its obligation to protect Libyan people from any further genocide and crimes against humanity without any direct military intervention on Libyan soil." Unquote. The Council at once claims that it is, I quote, the sole representative of all Libyans. Unquote. All Libyans request to be protected by the international community, we're told, without any foreign intervention on Libyan soil. But, it is added, Libyans would welcome a military intervention from the air, perhaps even from the sea. Why the indecisiveness, some ask? Why is the international community watching as Libyans are slaughtered by forces loyal to Qaddafi? If there is no military intervention, they add, how will the bloodshed be stopped? The international community has a responsibility to protect Libyans, it is repeated over and over from what, um, what some people call <coughs> widespread crimes against humanity. Others focus on the plight of non-citizen residents of Libya in the millions, some targeted and attacked as black Africans. And the International Red Cross adds, adds to the courts what we are witnessing in Libya is nothing but civil war, it says. What is going on? And why the careful parlance? In matters of life and death, as we should know, words have the propensity to kill. How one names the situation is critical, implying specific jurisdictions, distinct responsibilities, and different licenses to kill. When the international community intervenes militarily in Libya under a cosmopolitan obligation to protect Libyans as humans, 
it will be killing Libyans and others. And if the Interim Transitional National Council is killing Libyans and others, it is also claiming to be protecting Libyans. This is the paradox that we're not told of. Such national acts of sovereignty, recognized by the French state or not, claim a license to kill. And cosmopolitan acts of sovereignty, recognized by the international community or not, kill in the name of humanity, from the air, from the soil, and from the sea. This is the reason one must pause, think, and evaluate the situation very carefully. But for some, answers are clear. To the editors of the Christian Science Monitor, an international daily based in the United States, for instance, I quote, the killings in Libya have been atrocious enough to provide moral clarity, unquote. Titling their editorial the world's responsibility to protect Libyans, the editors conclude forcefully, if ever, I quote, if ever a responsibility to protect was made clear, it is now in Libya. <clears throat> the world has the responsibility to protect Libyans from what they call the excessive use of force by their government, while they continue, the world must also act against crimes against humanity. Having specified the accorded task of breaking a state's sovereignty, they explicitly say this, and having named the actor charged with this responsibility as the world, however, the editors quickly proscribe the task to the UN or NATO as if they were a shorthand for the world. And yet, the moral clarity of the cosmopolitan plea precludes the possibility of asking the question, why? Why this responsibility? Why upon the UN or NATO? Why upon the world? Why now? Why in Libya? And not, not say in Gaza. The responsibility to protect, also known as R2P, was published in December 2001 as a report of the International Commission on Intervention and State Sovereignty. This commission was officially constituted and partly financed by the Canadian government, which commissioned 12 experts, including Michael Ignatieff, the former director of the Carr Center for Human Rights at Harvard University and current leader of the Liberal Party of Canada, as well as Gareth Evans, the former Australian Foreign Minister and former President of the International Crisis Group. The Commission's aim was to draw an authoritative framework specifying the principles and standards of what it called external military intervention for human protection purposes. Changing the language of a global debate, the R2P, Responsibility to Protect, reformulated military intervention as an obligation in conscious contradistinction to a right of intervention. What is remarkable about this formulation is its skillful mobilization of the distinction between a right and an obligation, and its partisan resolve to decide the rivalry between the two conceptions of sovereignty, I mean, of, of intervention in favor of the latter. Notably, while a right may or may not be exercised, the character of an obligation is different. It embodies a moral imperative to act, in this case, to perform the function of protection, if necessary, with violence. But who is the addressee, the subject of this obligation? And what is the foundation, if any, of the moral imperative underpinning the responsibility to protect? 
Writing for The Guardian on Libya and what he calls the case for liberal intervention, Timothy Garton Ash, a British historian and recipient of the George Orwell Prize, reminds his readers that I quote, a decade ago, an independent, an independent commission that elaborated on the idea of the responsibility to protect spelled out six criteria for deciding whether military action is justified, unquote. Ash then specifies these six criteria of the responsibility to protect. Right authority, just cause, right intention, last resort, proportional means, and reasonable prospects. According to which, he claims, the military enforcement of a no-fly zone over Libya would not be justified. Yet, the very application of the R2P criteria to decide a specific case presumes that an earlier question, also formulated by Ash, has already received a positive answer. He asks, do we not have some responsibility to protect the people who have risen against Qaddafi? True, it is not absolutely clear to whom Ash refers to with the pronoun we in the former sentence or the following, I quote, we should prepare contingency plans, but we have not yet exhausted all other avenues, including trying to pry Gaddafi's cronies away from him by fair means and foul, unquote. But he is more suggestive when concluding that, I quote, any form of armed intervention by the West would spoil the greatest pristine glory of these events, which is that they are all about brave men and women liberating themselves, unquote. In other words, we may be the West, but they are something else, and we have a responsibility to protect them. As for the nature of the moral imperative presumed by the responsibility to protect, and more specifically, by the criteria for deciding whether a case falls under such an obligation, Ash affirms that the R2P's criteria are, I quote, essentially a modernized version of centuries-old Catholic standards for just war, unquote. It is important to reflect on this finding, affirmed by many other scholars and practitioners, because it makes explicit the political theological foundations of a cosmopolitan morality, which takes life, for instance, especially civil human life, to be a sacred possession or an inalienable right demanding protection. Another reason for reflecting on essentially theological standards is that the apparent secularity and hence the modernity of the paradigms of universal justice, law and order proposed for governing, administering and defending humanity should be questioned by an anthropology of cosmopolitan authority. Notably, the anthropologist Talal Assad has addressed this problem. Assad has not merely traced the genealogy of contemporary humanitarian law back to medieval Christian theology and its just war principles of necessity and proportionality. He has also commented at length, for example, on how the specific significance attributed to concepts such as intention, penance, and remorse in the context of an evolving medieval Christian theology can today find expression in the regretful apologies expressed by secular liberals for the unnecessary and disproportionate killings of innocents in war. Within the framework of this theology, as well as contemporary humanitarian law, it is worth repeating, certain killings of persons are endorsed in principle as necessary and as proportionate to the ends pursued by a just or legal war. 
operating within this very humanitarian logic, the responsibility to protect as language, doctrine, and practice is a recent and particularly powerful example of what Assad calls the etiquette of death dealing. If I have raised the theological dimensions of cosmopolitan theory and practice as a question, this is not only to observe how the editors of the Christian Science Monitor may be cosmopolitans as Christians, or to note, along with the historian Thomas Masnach, that medieval crusaders too may have been true cosmopolitans. I raise the question of theology to also emphasize how, at least since the 16th century colonization of the Americas, religion has been integral to the cultural logic through which the modern international legal order has been constituted and international relations practiced. In fact, scholars have meticulously revealed how Euro-Christian colonialism and the theological as well as racial, cultural, moral, and political supremacisms that accompany colonial practices are the actual foundation of contemporary international law. Without such a historical perspective, it is difficult to appreciate fully the significance of recent advances and retreats in the battlefield of cosmopolitics, where the sovereignty of Libya is once again contested. We may wish to remember, for example, that the problem of who was sovereign and why solidified in the violent interaction among imperial states and the so-called societies they conquered, colonized, and attempted to civilize. After decolonization, this problem has continued to persist in the international relations of a world legally ordered through apparently equal and equally sovereign nation states in the image of the United Nations General Assembly, the World Trade Organization, the World Bank, and the International Monetary Fund. And tomorrow, how will it be determined that Libya is non-sovereign in the first place? Who will determine the sovereign status of Libya or recognize, along with France, the sovereign status of the Inter-Transitional National Council, which, in its own words, I quote again, held its first meeting on Saturday, 5th of March, 2011, in the city of Benghazi, the temporary location, till the liberation of Tripoli, the capital city, and the permanent location of the council. Who will decide and adjudicate this declaration of independence? How and why? In a syndicated article titled The Responsibility to Protect Libyans, reproduced by the Wall Street Journal, a principal author of the Responsibility to Protect Doctrine, Gareth Evans, the co-chair of the International Commission on Intervention and State Sovereignty, declares in the first sentence, he says, sovereignty is not a license to kill. On the contrary, sovereignty, whether exercised in the name of humanity or the nation, is a bloody license to kill. From death row prisoners to soldiers, from police officers to NATO commanders, a multitude can further testify to the very legality of this license, which is, of course, no reason to accept it. If the international community intervenes militarily in Libya under a cosmopolitan obligation to protect Libyans as humans, it will be killing Libyans and others as humans. And if the Interim Transitional National Council is killing Libyans and others, it is also claiming to be protecting Libyans. This is one reason, only one reason among others, why we, 
the author and the audience can decide to pause, to evaluate the situation, and judge, judge very carefully. Thank you.
terms of the argument. Mm -hmm. And I guess that's related to a second question. Um, I mean, when you're asking, I'm, I'm very sympathetic to the perspective that you're mm -hmm. raising, so I guess I'm just playing devil's advocate here. But when you ask why the you know, why formulate the responsibility to protect, why do we have responsibility to protect the people who framed R2P will say, Rwanda. Mm -hmm. So, um, is it the case that Libya is a different category than Rwanda? There's different like contingent, mm -hmm. contextual um, circumstances for why it's not an appropriate response now, or was it not an appropriate response to mm -hmm. Rwanda either? Sorry, I know that's a lot, but if, I, if I can just pick yes, you back on that, not only why Libya, but why in particular does France, uh, followed by Britain, seem to be very keen and in, interestingly enough, uh, but that could be because its troops are held up in Afghanistan and Iraq, the United States is, is being more on the fence at least with, mm -hmm. the, with the UN Security Council debates. Mm -hmm. so. Oh, yes. Okay. I'll begin with the why now. No, this is great. I, I have the same question going with, and this is why I'm so happy to be here, so we can discuss. Um, in terms of why I'm raising the question of sovereignty, um, well, in a certain way, because I'm interested in the question of sovereignty, one. Second, the R2P is formulated as a problem of sovereignty. They don't say, oh, we, we let, well, they do say that. We let Rwanda happen. We cannot watch it never again, all that. But if you look at their report, and I urge you to look at it, study it, reconstruct it, it's amazing. They actually, what is at stake there, in my opinion, is a reformulation of sovereignty as such. It's a reformulation of sovereignty as responsibility. So that's the causal link. Uh -huh. Sovereignty is not only effective control over a given territory and whatnot. It implies responsibility. The logical link is that when the state, when a national state fails to fulfill its responsibility, then that responsibility must be taken on by the international community. Of course, the assumption is people need protection. Uh, and somebody has to protect the population. But this is so old. I mean, beginning with Hobbes, this formulation is not new. I mean, Hobbes sp spoke about the uh, protection obedience axiom. You know, that's how sovereignty has always justified itself. At least, I mean, not always, perhaps, but even starting with a classic te text as Hobbes. So, in a certain sense, it's a revival. Um, in terms of why um, it was re uh, pronounced. Uh, in the case of Darfur, if you take a look at Mahmoud Mamdani's book, um, Saviors and Serv uh, what is it called? Um, the, uh, Saviors and Survivors. Yes, Saviors and Survivors. Um, <laughs> politics. I mean, he, he, his last chapter on the, is on the responsibility to protect. It's the second time, actually, the Security Council has openly invoked the concept. Um, in terms of, uh, what else did you ask? Uh, why France and Britain, to Nadia's question? Well, one interpretation is that Libya is so, I mean, there's a whole issue of migration here. When there's a crisis, you have millions of refugees right now. Um, and today I was reading in the news that Italy, for example, refused to take refugees from Libya. So it's really, there's that issue of sovereignty too, migration. I mean, you can't call it migration really, it's forced migration. Um, so they have, I think, a special concern over fortress Europe and how they're going to maintain the, their own borders. Britain, I don't know, maybe, who knows? I mean, that's the other question for us, right? How do we know? Um, how do we know why Britain is doing what it, what it is doing? What are the limits of uh, the academic endeavor here? Or are we going to second guess at, at their motives, etc.? 
So, um, one of the advantages, I think, of taking good intentions seriously and not seeing it merely as some instrumental um, instrumentalization of people's, let's say, humanitarian feelings is that it allows you to ask more questions um, that don't get addressed other way. So, Nadia, I don't know why Britain, for example, France, revolutionary heritage, I mean, I really don't know. What do you think? But I think, I mean, I don't have a good answer either, uh, but I think, at least for me, part of taking the good intentions argument very seriously would also entail disaggregating. Exactly. Mm -hmm. um, and for me, for that reason, I don't have an answer, but mm -hmm. I would be interested to know mm -hmm. why France and Britain and not the United States in this particular instance. I would also be interested in not just focusing on the new world moment mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and the expansion not only of capitalism but also colonialism mm -hmm. and the role that uh, Christian law, which is the only kind of law, maybe mm -hmm. you when you're talking about Western Europe at that time, played in, in structuring mm -hmm. that process, but then also moving later into other moments of capitalism mm -hmm. and thinking about people like Grotius. Grotius mm -hmm. is not Catholic. Yes. Mm -hmm. He's coming out of it with a different sensibility. You move a couple of centuries down the line, you get to the abolitionists mm -hmm. who are also, you know, they're proposing a humanitarian argument, mm -hmm. but it's inflected by a different kind of understanding of Christianity, and so it becomes very important, mm -hmm. I think, to disaggregate those Absolutely, moments. absolutely. Oh, I mean, that's, I'm, my next project is about that, project is about that, but I can't do that now. Um, well, I think it also needs to be um, debated how to understand this political theology in relation to international law. What does it mean to write about a secular international law when the foundations are, for example, theological? That concerns the field of law, but uh, just one second, sorry, I'm getting distracted. Um, the other uh, thing about taking good intentions and Christian theology seriously is that it's not only, we should also disaggregate, I think, state actions from a real grassroots call for intervention too. Then how do we think about that? It's not only about what the state of France decides to do versus Britain decides to do. We in this room, perhaps, some of us want an intervention. So what are the conceptual frameworks through which we can think about um, what Hart and Negri would call calling empire into being? You know? How do we take literally internet petitions, ask the Darfur campaign, the campaign now for Libya, um, and not only in the so-called Western world, people are making these demands for somebody to intervene. Some people will say the UN can intervene, not the US, etc. So how do we think about this genuine, I want to think, genuine calls, not merely instrumental for imperialist purposes, etc. How do we theorize that? How do we make space for that? That's why um, I'm trying to raise the question of the moral grounding of these concerns, of a call for global justice, no matter how differently people may want to see it implemented. But there is a call. How do we think about this call? Um, you already asked the question, but I think... Yes, please. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, one question, one, one um, speculative observation mm -hmm. about France and Britain and, and, and America. It may be um, that they're acting for opposite reasons. The United States, as you yourself have said, um, because of its interventions in Iraq and also in Afghanistan, have so discredited themselves, mm -hmm. uh, particularly in the Middle East, as um, interventionists on the side of democracy and freedom and so on. But I think Obama ver realizes very well that it could be very counterproductive as well as not wanting to open the third front. Mm -hmm. the, the, the French and the British, I think, have been 
struggling for a long time with the idea of giving Europe a stronger role and yes. no longer being this passive dependency on yes. the United States. France, in particular, um, has, been has had this rather grandiose project of, of leading a, a new Mediterranean yes. uh, world, which is another reason why I think France wants to get involved. And as you yourself said, uh, the Maghreb and North Africa, what happens there has more direct consequences in Europe than it has in the US, mm -hmm. which is another reason why we may intervene. My question to you is, do you think they should intervene? Mm -hmm. I thought it was also... No. Okay, no. why not? <laughs> well, uh, I tried to spell out in like 35 minutes one reason why um, they shouldn't. But I think there is something to be said. I, I, I start speaking, then I start de immediately I'm deconstructing myself. Like, okay, like this. <laughs> there is something to be said for people liberating themselves, I want to say. And then immediately I say, well, it depends on how you understand the political constituency in question. Whether you, if you don't necessarily take national borders, uh, from a global justice perspective necessarily as embodying some kind of moral, political significance, then it's not obvious what the difference between Libyans and any other human would be. I'm speaking about the cosmopolitan framework, right? One world, humanity, the political community is the whole world. So the political solutions are going to be global as well, etc. But uh, what bothers me the most is what to make of the concept of autonomy. Let's say we let go of the idea of sovereignty for now. Let's think about autonomy. <coughs> what does it mean to be told that there are certain boundaries which no human activity should cross? You can, you can even, even beginning with the individual level, right? So in a certain sense, it seems all the more problematic to me to be dictating what each and every individual slash political community should or should not do, can or cannot do from a global uh, center. So in a sense, I share the Schmittian horror of this prospect, which I am, by the way, uh, I think, in my in interpretation, was also wary of. She was careful about that. So the larger problem for me is autonomy. Uh, okay, deconstruction point two. What do you do with the fact that the Revolutionary Council is asking for an intervention from the air? See, disintegration point three. Sovereignty. Let's think geographically here. Earth air, sea. So if you disintegrate sovereignty into all these geographical elements, if you privilege territorial sovereignty over, let's say, aerial sovereignty, that's exactly what's happening right now. Um, the Revolutionary Council is speaking as if an intervention from the air would not be a real intervention. Because why? We privilege the soil. Uh, we privilege somehow stepping your foot on my soil gets more um, formulated as more problematic than a violation of the air. Um, I know I'm moving away from your question why. It's just I'm not convinced um, on a number of counts. One, uh, it's going to kill people, obviously. Um, two, um, there will be, there is a question of control. The moment you get an uh, international coalition involved in this, the assumption is that it will, the coalition can help the revolutionaries to get rid of Qaddafi. But they won't do it for free. What will happen afterwards, even if that is achieved? They will claim a, a seat at the table, of course. They will claim concessions, of course. Um, so all these complications. And three, I don't, I, I mean, who are the revolutionaries? What do they want? Um, can they exercise 
some kind of control afterwards? I don't know. Uh, thank you um, for your talk. Um, uh, you know, the international community, I think, has been silent in the uh, past decade with respect to um, some, you know, massacres uh, in Bosnia, in, uh, in Iraq in 1991, mm -hmm. uh, in uh, Rwanda, and many other cases. And, you know, I think in the 21st century, it is the time to rethink uh, sovereignty in its you know, traditional terms. Mm -hmm. uh, in the Middle East, uh, you know, the uh, national sovereignty does not exist. Uh, the states, um, you know, enjoy all the uh, rights and privileges of having sovereignty, but they, are, they, are, they don't feel they are obliged to protect their own citizens, especially when we face such a, you know, kind of uh, riots, uprisings, and things like that. Uh, you know, the, uh, in, in the Middle East, there is no national security, there is just uh, a matter of regime security. We just have regime security. So. The, uh, the governments there just think of their own security, not the uh, security for their own people. So, uh, when, for instance, the Arab League uh, itself yeah, yes. asked for, yes. for an intervention, how can we say it is a matter of imperialism, it's a matter of aggrandizement, or self interest? Uh, why not? Why can't we say that? Why? Why can't we say it? Because, you know, the, uh, Libya is a, is a member of the Arab League, and this Arab League has always uh, be protecting its own members. It has been, you know, against the uh, war on Iraq. It has been against any kind of attack on any of its member states. But right now, even the Arab League uh, is, uh, uh, you know, in a position to see that what's going on in Libya is, um, is a kind of a genocide, like a massacre. So uh, there is no point we say uh, we can say that uh, it is a, mass a, matter, a matter of imperialism or, you know. Uh, there is no doubt the, uh, the states that want to engage in kind of uh, military intervention. Uh, it's not a matter of identifying these states, not a matter of self-interest. Self um, let, let me take it a bit more personally. If uh, you were a Libyan and you had some relatives over mm -hmm. there right now, uh, you could not sleep very well these days. You could just think of that, whether they will, you are still alive, uh, so, you were one of those people who supported the military intervention as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. Perhaps, you know, these days, whenever there is a demonstration going on in Iran, I can't sleep very well here because mm -hmm. I still think of my students and my friends, but there is still a law already, yeah. you know, taken uh, into mm -hmm. custody, they are in prison. What will happen to them? So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, as an Iranian, I like some uh, kind of. Uh, well, military intervention, at least more support by the international community for protecting the people from the, uh, uh, from the you know, transgression of the government. Uh, because this is the Middle East, and in the Middle East we, we just have the regime security. The, the governments never think of national security of their own citizens. So you agree with Ahmed Dinejad on this point? Uh, no. He doesn't want intervention either. Ah, no, you know, military intervention in, in the case of Iran Iraq is a bit uh, premature, it's too soon. But uh, in case of Libya, when okay. we see kind of genocide or massacre, for sure we should stop. May, I, may I respond to that by saying, well, that, that perspective assumes uh, that the Arab state and the states that form it, first of all, are actually representing their own people, right? So. Why give a special, um, special standing to the Arab League? For, wait, Saudi Arabia just intervened in Bahrain, you know? I mean, who, where does it say that Arab states themselves cannot be imperialistic? Um, no, there is a matter of invitation. You know, the government right, but I think it's serious. You're right. right. No, I, I realize this is not a, a very... I mean, I wrote... What I read to you today has been on the internet, right? I can't sleep either. It's not like it's easy to say, I said no to you, should there be an intervention? I said no. Uh, but it's not easy to say it either, because I know um, if, I mean, who knows if Qaddafi uses the chemical weapons, nuclear weapons, if there's a massacre, then how will I sleep at night too? Everybody is 
feeling this, the burden of the same um, problem, of course. It's not one people feeling it less or more. But then how do we... Then let me pose it this way. Where is politics, where is philosophy in response to the blackmail, I want to say, of a question of life? So how do you create space? when the problem is framed in terms of saving lives all the time. Where is the space to think? In, in that case, there is no politics, there is no philosophy. The answer is clear. Save lives. So when do we ever get to think? When do we ever get to form a new politics? When do we ever get to say no? Because who can say no to life? Right? So. Um, that's one thing. The second thing is, even the Libyan revolutionaries themselves, they do not want, I've been reading their press statements, doing research on this, and they don't want, for example, ground truth. Because they also have to justify to their own cadre, to their own people who are against intervention too. Strategically, it could help them topple Gaddafi, that's for sure. But then they also have to maintain their own legitimacy vis-a-vis -vis the people in whose name they're acting who are opposed to intervention. Hence the compromise. From the air, it's okay. From the soil, don't intervene. Perhaps from the sea, you can come and bomb Qaddafi's forces too. So it's not clear um, that there's a case for intervention even from the Libyan side. Leave aside the question of civil war. I mind you, Qaddafi has forces fight, fighting for him too. He has tribes that are loyal to him. Uh, they are fighting each other in a certain, in a, in a very important sense. I'm not saying their forces are equal. I'm not saying watching it will not give advantage to the ones who already have the arms, of course. But it's in, if, you, if you believe the revolutionary discourse without questioning, then what you have is the state fighting the people. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, it seems to be a bit more complicated than that because also Qaddafi has forces fighting with him. Um, Arab League, again, I don't take its legitimacy um, for granted. I, th you know, even the NATO has said. With the Arab League's mandate, we can act because they want the brown people to justify an intervention into brown people's lives. Um, it is global multiculturalism in that sense. And Arab League, in my view, is a representative of that. They get to speak for the Arabs. And earlier they said, nobody should intervene. This is an internal Arab affair. Huh? So how does that sovereignty get established? What happens to Arabs concern only Arabs, and we are the representative of the Arab people. Um, in the meantime, Saudi Arabia has intervened in Bahrain to, to help the state kill its own protesters. So it's very, very complicated. And my concern now, I think what we should do is to resist the pressure of The pressure not to think, the pressure not to look into things more carefully. I'm not saying if you look into things more carefully, you will arrive at my conclusion. On the contrary, even I am trying to decide if this is true, what I have said, or if it's valid. So let us try to create that space. Otherwise, it's bare life politics. It's what I got then problematizes uh, as an eight the question of, of, of life as politics, because I think, um, at least we like to think of certain situations as being exceptions, mm -hmm. and, that, and that slaughter and genocide is so clear that we don't really have to worry too much about politics disappearing altogether because we hope that these are exceptions that require interventions. Mm -hmm. But it seems that, um, on the one hand, um, we have, like you said, the kind of romantic notions of self-liberalization that might be present in Libya, and because the situation is, is complex and, and because there's actually resistance that, that has um, some kind of you know, military backing, you seem to think or you believe that at the, at because of that point or at this point, we have the privilege of, of pausing and reflecting and, 
and allowing there to be space to think. While there are other situations where I'm, I, I, I'm sure, at least I hope you would, um, you would actually think of it as a kind of clear-cut case for intervention. Yes. And I was wondering, if, oh, intervention. I mean, in, in a case of, of defenseless genocide, where, like I said, it would, it would be a kind of exception, like Rwanda, um, which I, maybe I, is overused. But I was wondering if, if you do think there's a line where, um, where it becomes the space, the, the space to think and pause um, it, is no longer an available option. And, and um, so that, that's kind of my first question. And my second is um, that, that on, the other, on the other side, the side of, of immense complexity where, you know, where there is that space and, and where you can kind of, uh, kind of recognize this romantic notion of liberalization because it, it's, it seems like a possibility. If you look at the case of Egypt, there was a favorable, a favorable outcome eventually because of different, different kinds of pressure. Um, I wanted to ask what you thought of, of um, the incentives of, of allowing a situation to play itself out by a government kind of compromising in the end, the, the incentives that exist in international law, um, if you think that you know, they're adequate, if you think that the Security Council needs to be completely restructured, if the ICC is, uh, you know, if, if, these are, if these are sort of adequate emblems of... Uh, yes. Is there a place? Is there any situation where the situation is clear cut? Um, and the exception and the rule. Very good question. I'm more interested in the criteria that people propose to be able to adjudicate such a case, right? So, for example, uh, some members of the Security Council have said, um, well, it's, it, what's happening in Libya hasn't uh, crossed the threshold, right? This is one of the arguments against intervention. It hasn't crossed the threshold of <coughs> genocide or crimes against humanity. What we're witnessing, the kind of slaughtering we're, we're witnessing is still normal. I want to give you an example uh, connecting to your second question about international criminal court and whatnot. In 2005, if I'm not mistaken, the International Criminal Court issued a response to civil society, global civil society, who had petitioned the International Criminal Court to investigate what the US, the UK, and other coalition forces did in Iraq. You know? The ICC never took up the case. It could have, because it's allowed to uh, pick the case up for investigation, uh, even without a Security Council referral. And in the statement, the ICC said, well, according to our preliminary uh, examination, the casualties in Iraq, we, they said, we've done a regression analysis with statistical data comparing casualties uh, in Rwanda to Rwanda, for example, and the casualties recorded for Iraq. And Iraq doesn't meet the statistical test. There are not enough casualties for us to initiate an investigation. So I have a problem with this way of thinking. This is what I want to problematize. And if you ask me personally, um, I'm trying to explore ways to think outside of this utilitarian logic, this logical proportionality of comparisons, n numbers. Um, then you will ask, then what is the criteria for ever deciding um, whether a case is clear or not? My response to that would be, I think at one level, um, people have to decide for themselves, the criteria should be, for example, like the um, Spanish brigades, the international Spanish brigades, they did it. If you care that much, then pick up your own arms and go to Libya and fight. People have done that. What is the criteria um, for such a partisan action, for example? Why this transfer of action and why this transfer of agency to the state and then from the state to the international level? It's as if we're sitting at a chessboard and we're saying, the pieces should be moved like this. I'm going to move my rook here, give Qaddafi a check there, 
and we're not even on the chessboard. Um, the positional privilege that you're speaking of, here, this is the positional privilege. We're discussing who should kill whom uh, in Libya, whether it should be done legally or through the International Criminal Court or the UN Security Council. I know I'm not responding uh, directly, but I'm trying to create a space outside of this state slash international law framework to be able to think about this person. I just sort of want to take a different line of questioning a little bit. I was wondering if you could talk a bit about your choice of the category of cosmopolitanism yes. and what work that allows you to do that's maybe the same or different. I guess I'm just not mm -hmm. understanding what cosmopolitan does, that like universal, mm -hmm. that's what is different from universal or from international, the international community, which you speak of a lot more. Yeah. Um, or global, I mean, I, yeah. if you could just sort of flash yes. that out. Yes, very good. Um, yes, I'm trying to, um, uh, going back to the earlier question uh, where we were speaking of imagining global justice, like who is the political constituency of global justice? Because it's not obvious how one, for example, at the time that Arendt was writing The Eichmann in Jerusalem, she speaks of the international community as a collection of nations, right, with or without states. So humanity, in a certain sense, the literature and the thinking she is addressing, is thought of in terms of a collection of nations. Um, so I use cosmopolitanism to talk about a political project that doesn't necessarily think of global community in terms of nations, um, so it's different from internationalism, where it would be about national solidarity. Right? As an <coughs> Egyptian, I would be in solidarity with the Libyans. Um, the kind of solidarity that cosmopolitanism, and there are different versions of it, so one should really speak about cosmopolitanisms, um, is that it takes the relationship between you and I as a relationship between human beings not necessarily primarily as uh, national subjects, so to speak. I'm interested in this, not only from the perspective of international law or international criminal court and all that, but also um, uh, in terms of a global politics that is imagined at the grassroots level. So then the, the question becomes, um, if cosmopolitanism is implicated in a project of empire on top, hmm, is there a cosmopolitanism possible at the grassroots level, which is not imperial, which doesn't have imperial relationships? So back to the question of universalism, you know, there are those who claim that universalism is necess necessarily imperial, for example. And there are others who imagine universalism uh, almost an equal of some kind of egalitarianism. Um, I, I prefer to speak of cosmopolitanism to be able to imagine those top and down, to give a, a spatial analogy here, politics at the same time, both at the grassroots and and um, more bureaucratically. So I have a simple question. Mm -hmm. I was curious, as you were giving your talk, I kept sort of returning in my mind to the example of Somalia and thinking mm -hmm. about the ways both in which intervention has worked and in which sovereignty, mm -hmm. sovereignty has been reconfigured in the international imagination several times. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering how you would write Somalia into this sort of conceptualization of your talk today? Mm -hmm. Well, I don't know enough about that case to be able to speak to it. Okay. Um, I noted it to think about it, but I haven't done my research. Okay, okay. I mean, I think it's an interesting example yes, in the sense so. that after Somalia was sort of abandoned by this interventionist mm -hmm. effort, there's been the ways in which 
reasonably stable political entities have emerged there mm -hmm. and existed with little to no international official international recognition. Mm -hmm. um, and oh, yet, I see, I see what you were asking. In terms of the status of Somaliland, and yet mm -hmm. it continues to factor into this larger chessboard that you speak of while it exists outside of it. Well, I can speak to the particularity of Somalia, um, but I think returning to the previous question too, um, this question of who is sovereign and why afflicts, um, I, I mean, it's just interesting what kind of reasons people give for it. Now there's an emergent literature in international relations theory, for example, that claims that sovereignty the recognition of sovereignty should be contingent upon whether a state is democratic or not. So there is a whole movement that says any state that is not democratic shouldn't even be recognized as sovereign. So people are proposing the League of Democratic States, for example. All of this is related to the theory of democratic peace, of course, that democracies don't fight each other, um, that democracies form a club, that the only legitimate form of government is democracy, of course, liberal democracy, etc., etc. Uh, and there are really good meaning, good intentions, I want to take that seriously, liberals who are making a case for that. There are books written about the democratic peace. Now the international lawyers are arguing a norm has emerged. Of course, part of international law is what they call customary law. Um, so it's interesting how the custom re-emerges in international law. So they say, according to customary law, a new democratic norm has emerged. So if a state is undemocratic, it's violating this customary law. Uh, therefore, it can be punished, for example. Hence, Iraq, for example, many people are arguing. Saddam needs to be toppled wise, it's a dictatorship, it's not a democratic state, we have a right to topple. Uh, we have a right to intervene to ensure <coughs> that a state is democratic. And we won't recognize it unless it's democratic. Hence the rogue state fails safe um, proposals. Um, I guess uh, a couple of questions. First is, um, I guess, uh, I guess on a, a clarification issue is if if it's the case that the conclusion of the talk is that we shouldn't uh, in, that there shouldn't be intervention in India, is that based upon the uh, critiques you offer of the Eurocentric basis, the theological basis, the imperial basis, and if it is, why doesn't that preclude any type of intervention? If, on the other hand, it is that the call of your work is to engage in a, a sort of deconstruct the moment kind of type of debate, thinking and pause uh, as you talk about. Is, it, is there a danger that that pause uh, reinscribes the type of um, the, the type of sovereign entities that you're calling into question or you're critiquing in the first place? Absolutely. Right. The problem of why, why doesn't in some ways that deconstruction bleed into uh, a negation and leaves out the constructive moment of attempting to deal what? with the the problems that these sovereignties are creating. And, and lastly, this is this Wait, wait, wait. I, I want to understand your question, so okay. let me clarify. Sure. You're saying there's a chance, there's a possibility that your critique may be reinscribing the sovereign orders that you're critiquing. So my question is how? Um, can you elaborate a little bit? Uh, if we take, if there is a pragmatic element to mm -hmm. your critique in the mm -hmm. sense that we should take a moment to pause, as you say at the end, mm -hmm. of what you're doing. Doesn't the temporal moment, the, the temporality of that mm -hmm. pausing, act as a political action in and of itself, yes. which accepts uh -huh. the, the you know, sovereign court. entities as mm -hmm. they are in that established order that mm -hmm. is perhaps engaging in atrocities at that time? Mm -hmm. And given the in, you know import that's in some of these interventions of time, uh, you know, is there a danger that there's real Reinscription here that's not something mm -hmm. theoretical. And the, the last part of this question is um, to go back to the first part, which is if if imperialism is a reason not to, I, I guess I'm confused as to why Eurocentrism, theology, and imperialism are reasons not to intervene. You're confused 
whether I am providing them as reasons, not to include. Right. Hmm. Uh, well, I'm not sure if I understand the third part. But uh, I want to respond to the second one, which is what I've been grappling with. You may be right. Maybe the moment taken to think is not in action necessarily, but um, a reinscription of the status order, the, the status order, the status quo, because you're extracting yourself while things continue to happen. Um, of course, the assumption is uh, that we matter anyhow. We matter somehow. Um, maybe. But I want to take that seriously. That's why I, I pose the question, if it is a question of life and death all the time, um, where is the space to think? Where is the space to think? Where is the space of deliberation, internal deliberation? Even if you are in a revolutionary moment, even if you are a partisan, even if you are a cadre of some kind of revolutionary organization, even if you are a part of the military, I would personally hope that you take that moment to disobey, to disobey orders, to arrive at your own conclusion, to participate or to withdraw participation. So, um, uh, allegorically speaking, I don't see a dissimilarity between the kind of pause that I'm urging and the kind of pause, let's say, a conscientious objection, objector takes to disobey orders. You need that time to arrive at your own conclusions and to act accordingly, even while the military is continuing to operate around you. So that space need to be, needs to be guaranteed, in my opinion, even at the heat of revolutionary action, even at the heat of uh, the mil military order. So we need, uh, yes, absolutely. So if it reinscribes uh, what is continuing to happen all around, let it reinscribe it in that sense. Well, that gets back to the first part of the question, which is why doesn't that moment of pausing it seems that you conclude that that will always result in conscientious objection? No, it will not. So uh -huh. No, it won't, absolutely not. See, I say let us pause and think, but I'm not assuming that you will choose to be a conscientious objector in the end. There is no guarantee. And uh, I have a problem with everybody uh, that would think otherwise, right? That is exactly the problem. How can you be uh, a thinking being and not arrive at a democratic conclusion, for example? Um, I, I want to take this very seriously because when the, the piece, actually it consists of two pieces, it was published on this journal called Jadilia on the internet, one of the comments I got was exactly that. Well, you're proposing for us to pose and think, but aren't you therefore participating in the killing by failing to prevent, argue that the killings should be prevented? And I've been thinking about it for four days, and this is the answer I have arrived at. Yes, maybe. Um, but we need that space to arrive at other possible courses of action, too. We also need to give Aisha space to eat. So <laughs> <laughs> we're going to thank her for the great